So I accept the award in honor of those I left behind. Thank you. He said that the true heroes were the ones that were still there fighting. And we should not forget that we still have boots on the ground there. I've served with these soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen in Afghanistan and Iraq. They are our next greatest generation. A team of guys that supported me along the way, and eight of them didn't make it back. And I'm here standing in front of you on their behalf. I'm here for every single Vietnam veteran to do the same thing, you know, to welcome them all home and thank you and thank them very much. And I thank you for remembering our fallen this evening and honoring them. Hello, I'm Jim Roberts, President of the American Veterans Center. Here at the AVC, every day is, in a sense, Veterans Day. Day in and day out, it is our mission and our privilege to honor our veterans' legacy of service and sacrifice and to preserve that legacy for future generations. We seek to accomplish our mission through a wide variety of programs. There is one program that is particularly close to my heart, however, and that is the American Veterans Center Honors. The Honors is the only awards program in America that pays tribute to those who deserve it most, our veterans. Today I welcome you to the television broadcast of the American Veterans Center Honors Program, and I invite you to join me as we walk through history with American heroes who have made history and even changed history. I want to express my heartfelt thanks to our partners, the Pentagon Channel, who are broadcasting this tribute so that it may be seen by our servicemen and women deployed around the world. I hope you are inspired by what you see, that you will be moved to honor our military in your own way, in your own community. So thanks for watching, and now, the American Veterans Center Honors. And now, your host for the American Veterans Center Honors, longtime television news anchor and Air Force veteran of Vietnam, Paul Berry. These men and women in our military who leave their com the comfort of their homes to go to places that you don't even want to think about being. And they spend not just days or weeks, months, years sometimes there protecting us. No one deserves an honor any more than that. And I just, uh, I just hope that we understand that tonight because this is special tonight. I'd like to welcome the 15th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Richard B. Myers. He began his Air Force career as a combat pilot in Vietnam, going on to become Commander-in-Chief of the North American Aerospace Defense Command and the U.S. Space Command before becoming Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He served as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from 2001 until his retirement in 2005. And while I was in that foxhole somewhere in Vietnam, I said, one day, I'm going to meet that man. I said that to myself. <laughs> Please welcome General Richard Myers. General Myers, what a pleasure, sir. Thank always you. a Again, pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Isn't he great? Evenings like tonight make me just so proud to be an American. We've, we're surrounded by heroes, several generations of heroes their families, those that appreciate them, those that helped sponsor this event. I mean, only in America can does something like this happen. And to the American Veterans Center, I was asked uh, a while back by Jim, would you mind being the honorary chairman? And the, action, the truth was, yeah, I kind of do, I'm pretty busy, but I said, I'll do it. I've never been associated with an organization that can get more done than this organization. They are awesome. They're absolutely awesome. And I probably haven't been a very good honorary chairman, 
but I really appreciate what they do. And I don't know of any other organization other than the American Veterans Center that connects all generations of military, those who served long time ago, those who are serving today, they do this really interesting thing of connecting all of that for all of us, for our benefit. And particularly in the last couple of days for the benefit of a lot of uh, service academy folks, our ROTC folks, I mean, they connect the dots in ways that nobody else really does. I think that's a great public service. I think it's really important for our country. And I am proud to be a very small part uh, of this organization. I think we got a great night planned tonight, a very special night. Uh, I would say a unique night as we get to the end of the, the show tonight. It's a very unique uh, night that we're all going to be part of. And it's all about, as uh, was it you, Paul, that said it? It's all about freedom. That's what it's all about. And so thank you all for being here. We're going to have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, General Myers. And you'll be joining us on stage this evening to help present some of the awards a little bit later. And now, before we eat, and we're about to do that, I would like to, you know, all, this works because folks are willing to support this. And one of our great supporters, we're very pleased to bring to the podium just for a few moments to say a couple of things to you. I'd like to introduce Christopher Jones, Corporate Vice President and President of Northrop Grumman Technical Services uh, Sector, representing tonight's uh, presenting sponsor. Let's give them a round of applause. Northrop Grumman, ladies and gentlemen. Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, <laughs> Thank you. And on behalf of Northrop Grumman and our employees, we're very proud to sponsor this event tonight, honoring our men and women from across the generations. We owe so much to those who defend the freedoms that we treasure, freedoms that have been challenged but have never been broken thanks to our veterans. They have served with loyalty, integrity, and more significantly, with great sacrifice. Tonight, we pay tribute to those, including the thousands of our Northrop Grumman employees, who have protected our nation. On this evening, let us remember our veterans who have given so much to preserve our way of life. To all of our veterans, past and present, thank you for your service and your sacrifice. And to the American Veterans Center, thank you for all that you do to honor, serve, and remember our veterans. Thank you and have a great evening. Now, folks, I love this part of the program. We do it every year. And one of our favorite traditions, come on up, Aaron. Uh, here at the ABC Honors is the singing of the military service songs, okay? All right, with that, let's hear it. Aaron, take it away. Thank you. We're gonna start with the Merchant Marine song, Heave Ho, and this is your audience participation moment. Heave ho, my lads, heave ho. It's a long, long way to go. It's a long, long pull with our hatches full. Braving the wind, braving the sea, fighting the treacherous foe. Heave ho, my lads, heave ho. Let the seas roll high or low. We can cross any ocean, sail any river. Give us the goods and we'll deliver. Damn the submarine. We're, We're America's merchant marine. Any Coast Guard out there? We're always ready for the call. We place our trust in thee. Through surf and storm and howling gale, I shall our purpose be. Semper Paratus is our guide, our fame, our glory too. To fight, to save, a fight and die. I coast God, we are for you. I know it is right around. <laughs> Off we go into the wild blue yonder, flying high into the sun. Here they come, swimming to meet our thunder. Had a boy, give us a gun. Down we dive, spotting a flame from under. Off we go, hell of a Stop 
wishing you a happy voyage home. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles on the air, on land, and sea. Press to fight for. The Audie Murphy Awards represent a man who was one of the most decorated American soldiers of World War II, receiving every award the Army had to offer, including the Medal of Honor. The Audie Murphy Award is the oldest award presented by the American Veterans Center. Let's have the story of our first recipient of the 2013 Audie Murphy Award. One of the great military lives of the 20th century began on February the 11th, 1923, in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Son of an army officer who fought in World War I, Frederick James Croson Jr. grew up near an Army Reserve Cavalry base, looking forward to his own future Army career. Croson later enrolled in Rutgers University and participated in the ROTC program. He was nearing graduation when, on December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, plunging the United States into World War II. Called to active duty, Croson attended Officer Candidate School and was commissioned a second lieutenant in August 1944. He soon found himself leading a platoon in the 63rd Blood and Fire Division in the European Theater. Croson and his men saw heavy combat notably in the Colmar pocket in early 1945. It was during this epic battle that an army lieutenant by the name of Audie Murphy would brave enemy fire to cover his comrades retreat, actions for which he would be awarded the Medal of Honor. Croson's men continued to see some of the toughest fighting of the war, suffering tremendous casualties and seeing a 300% turnover in its strength. Yet despite being wounded himself, Croson never left his unit rising to the rank of captain and taking command of his company as it drove into the heart of Germany. Frederick Croson's career continued to flourish following World War II. He commanded a battalion in Korea and would go on to serve two tours in Vietnam. Later, General Croson would command the legendary 82nd Airborne Division and the 7th Corps in Germany, before rising to serve as the 16th Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. General Croson's many awards include two silver stars, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and three bronze stars with valor. He has had the distinction of receiving the Purple Heart three times, having been wounded in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, as well as in an assassination attempt while serving as Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Army, Europe. General Croson rose through the ranks by proving himself a fierce warrior, a great leader, and an insightful thinker a career that was launched on the battlefields of Europe as part of the greatest generation. For his long and distinguished service, and for his valor in the Second World War, the American Veterans Center is proud to name General Frederick J. Croson, Jr., recipient of the Audie Murphy Award. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the 2013 Audie Murphy Award, General Frederick J. Croson, Jr. General, please come forward. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I was told that I have 60 seconds in which to say thank you. And of course, I want to start with the leaders and the staff members of the American Veterans Center uh, for tendering me first with a nomination and now with the, the award of, it's a very humbling thing for me when I think that uh, there were almost 12,000 people, men and women, who served in World War II. And I'm the one here tonight. Uh, uh, and, and my question is, why me? Uh, I think that there are so many people deserving of this kind of an award. And then they make it even more humbling when they associate my name with Audie Murphy, the most distinguished and most decorated soldier of World War II. And I offer my thanks to his memory and to him. He's still an inspiration to any soldier who understands from what he did what the individual soldier can accomplish in combat. We owe him the thanks for that kind of a, an example to serve for us. And now while I'm thanking people, I have a young lady over here at the table with me who married me when I was a corporal and she started a 40-year career in the Army as an Army wife. And with all of the volunteer services that Army wives have conducted over the years, I think they deserve an award as much as we do. And if she stays with me for a little while longer, <laughs> we'll be celebrating our 70th anniversary in about two or three months. <laughs> Uh, you're using up some of my 60 seconds. Uh, so finally, I want to say thank you to all of you who are in attendance today. Uh, you certainly have made this a memorable occasion for me, which I will cherish for the rest of my days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now like to introduce Marine Corps veteran of uh, Iraq, uh, Lindsay uh, Valenti, representing Northrop Grumman, who will be helping us to present our next award. Where are you? Are you? Here she comes. Please give her a round of applause, would you please? <laughs> nice to have you with us. And now, the story of the second recipient this year of the 2013 Audie Murphy Award. During the early days of World War II, Japanese intelligence broke every code the U.S. devised. They anticipated American actions, sabotaged messages, and issued false commands. The American response was an increasingly complex code that required hours of encryption and decryption. All agreed, the military needed a better way to communicate. Philip Johnston, son of a missionary who grew up on the Navajo reservation, had an idea. Johnston believed that with no alphabet and its nearly impossibility to master if not learned early, the Navajo language might just make a nearly indecipherable code. In 1942, Johnston convinced the Marines to recruit Navajo men 
to devise a code that even other Navajos wouldn't be able to break. They chose 29 men for this secret mission. This elite unit was to train as Marines, while conceiving a code designed to be unbreakable by Japanese intelligence. Among the 29 was Chester Nez, who had enlisted in the Marine Corps shortly after Pearl Harbor. Nez and his comrades went to Camp Pendleton, where they created a code so ingenious that it could communicate in just 20 seconds what took coding machines 30 minutes to do. Native words were associated with military terms they resembled. For example, Navajo for turtle was code for tank, and a dive bomber was a chicken hawk. To supplement, words could be spelled out by using the first letter of a Navajo word's English meaning. Armed with their new code, Nez and the code talkers were dispatched to the South Pacific. Nez landed on Guadalcanal in November 1942, then Bougainville, Guam, Peleliu, and Anguar. The code they had developed so confounded the Japanese and was deemed so vital that the code talkers were not given leave for three years. Not until January 1945 was Chester Nez given his first break from war and allowed to return home. The Code Talkers' most legendary achievement came during the epic Battle of Iwo Jima, where they coded hundreds of transmissions with perfect accuracy, lending to victory in one of the Pacific's pivotal battles. Yet they returned home to little fanfare, as their code was considered so important it remained classified for 20 years. They finally would receive recognition nearly 60 years later, when in 2001, the original 29 were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. By war's end, 421 men served as Navajo code talkers, yet the original 29 still hold a special place of reverence. Today, only one remains as a symbol of their heroic service, Chester Nez, for his vital contribution to victory in the Pacific and for his role in preserving the history of this legendary group of men the American Veterans Center is proud to name Chester Nez, recipient of the Audie Murphy Award. Recipient of the 2013 Audie Murphy Award, the last living original Navajo code talker, Marine Corps Corporal Chester Nez. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody here, and I'm very grateful to receive this award. I'm so happy about it. One thing that I always remember is some of the hardest things that I went through during World War II. But my luck came through, and I just came home and spent the days and nights with my family. I am very happy to be here with you people, and I'm very happy to say thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. God bless you and well deserved, sir. Well deserved. Chester Nez. Uh, this is uh, the first transmission my grandfather set when, um, sent out when he hit the islands in Guadalcanal. Um, it, he, he remembers it very well. Papa, would you give him the example of the code, the first code you sent out when you hit the, the beaches in World War II? Uh, on Guadalcanal, the first beach that we hit was <clears throat> a very interesting and very terrible thing to go through. And uh, a message came in me that said, not Elizabeth don't rance, don't change the house. Anyway, machine gun that's on your right flank, destroy. That's what I said. Thank you. Your dad? I'm your grandson. Your grandson. 
his grandson here with him tonight. Nice so much. Thank you so much, sir. That's special, folks. That's very special. He is the last remaining survivor of, uh, of the Navajo Code. So what you hear tonight may never be heard again. It may never be heard again in this kind of setting. General Raymond G. Davis received 18, count them, 18 American and Foreign Service Awards during his distinguished career, including the Navy Cross in World War II and the Distinguished Service Medal during Vietnam. However, it is for his incredible heroics at Chosan Res Reservoir for which he was awarded the Medal of Honor that he has become a legend in the United States Marine Corps. And let's listen to the story of this year's honoree. Following the service of such now legendary African-American units like the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II, President Truman signed Executive Order 9981 in 1948 ordering full integration of the United States military. Yet, while the military was officially desegregated, it would be up to a new generation of black service members to ensure that this equality would be realized. Shortly after Truman signed his order, a young man walked into a recruiting office in Topeka, Kansas, eager to join the Navy. Frankie Peterson Jr. grew up in Topeka during the Second World War, fascinated by the planes flying in and out of the nearby Army airfield. He dreamt of one day flying himself, and upon coming of age, wasted little time in joining the military. Quickly, Peterson realized just how hard he was going to have to work to overcome lingering biases within the military. When his recruiter forced him to retake the entrance exam on suspicion of cheating, after achieving the highest score in that station's history, it was the first of many challenges to face and obstacles to overcome. Yet Peterson demonstrated unusually strong talents, and in 1951, he entered the Naval Aviation Cadet Program. After completing flight training, he accepted a commission as a second lieutenant in the Marines, becoming the first African-American aviator in the United States Marine Corps. Peterson entered combat in Korea in 1953. On June 15th, he took lead of his division on a mission over North Korea pummeling enemy targets, inflicting heavy damage, and returning his comrades home safely, earning him the Distinguished Flying Cross. He would fly 64 combat missions in Korea, earning six air medals, and go on to fly in Vietnam, commanding a squadron of attack fighters and earning numerous awards, including the Purple Heart, after being wounded in action. In 1979, 31 years after Executive Order 9981, Frankie Peterson Jr. made history once again when President Carter named him the first African-American general in Marine Corps history. He would rise to the rank of Lieutenant General, retiring in 1988 with the titles of Silver Hawk and Gray Eagle as the senior and ranking aviator in both the Marine Corps and the Navy. Few officers enjoy the universal respect earned by Lieutenant General Frankie Peterson Jr. For this respect, and his groundbreaking achievements and contributions to our military, the American Veterans Center is honored to name him recipient of the Raymond G. Davis Award. The recipient of the 2013 Raymond G. Davis Award, Lieutenant General Frank E. Peterson, Jr. We're going to get a shot and then we'll have you say a few words. Okay. Take your time. No hurry. Please, sir, say a few words to us, would you? Yes, please. Well, first let me just say it's a, uh, an honor to be part of the ceremony. 
and I <clears throat> keep hearing the word hero, but I'm, I'm not a hero. I was given an assignment. I flew my combat missions, in fact, 300 in both Korea and Vietnam. But I think that <clears throat> here lately, there has been some confusion in terms of what constitutes combat. Combat zone is, yes, combat zone. But combat is where you have 18 and 20 year old kids at the pointy end of the sword and they're living in mud and dirt. And each of my missions, I would say about 90% were devoted to support of ground combat troops. During uh, Vietnam, I lost one of my aircraft at night in Laos. Never recovered the aircraft <clears throat> and of course never found the crash site. They're still missing. So I accept the award in honor of those I left behind. Thank you. And I, you know what? I believe with all my heart that Given the chance right now, he could fly the hell out of an F-16 right now. He'd just, he just take it, make it do all the things it's supposed to do. He could do that. He's just got that spirit and that honor. Joe Ronnie Hooper is among the most decorated men in American military history, earning 37 medals throughout his service in Vietnam, including the Medal of Honor. And before we show you the story of our 2013 honoree, we would like to invite Mrs. Faye Hooper, who we've known each other for a while, widow of Joe Hooper, to say a few words about Joe and help present the award. Come on up, Faye. We love having you with us here. I, you didn't happen this time, did it? We got here, girl. <laughs> it's good to see you again. You bet. Nobody told me that I had a minute to speak, so I assume that I have an hour. <laughs> it is my great honor to present the Joe Hooper Award at this year's American Veterans Conference Center. I would like to express my thanks to Jim Roberts for establishing this award in memory of my husband, Joe Hooper. Joe loved America. He once stated, serving one's country is a great privilege, not a worsome sacrifice. He would be so proud to see the love of country, the professionalism, and the courage of the young men and women serving in the military today. Joe would be especially honored and humbled to know that the award bearing his name is presented tonight to Bob Carey, a man who has served his country as a Navy SEAL, governor, senator, educator, author, and devoted family man. Because of men like Bob Carey, today's soldiers uh, and our beloved veterans, we are able to live in the greatest country in the world. Let us all remember to pray for our soldiers and for God to continue to bless America. Thank you. Joseph Robert Carey, known as Bob, grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, graduating from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 1966 with intentions of becoming a pharmacist. By that time, the situation in Vietnam was escalating into full-blown war with hundreds of thousands of Americans deployed. Rather than wait to be drafted, upon graduation, Carey enlisted in the U.S. Navy and soon became an officer with the elite Navy SEALs. Lieutenant Carey arrived in Vietnam in 1968, leader of a squadron that dubbed itself Carey's Raiders. On March 14, 1969, intelligence learned that a Viet Cong unit had infiltrated a village on an island near Nha Trang Bay and was killing civilians. Carey was ordered to lead his men on a midnight mission to neutralize the enemy and capture its leaders. Upon landing, Carey split his men into two teams and scaled a 350-foot cliff to approach from above. 
Nearing the enemy camp, Carey and his men were spotted, and a maelstrom of fire erupted. In the action, a grenade exploded at Lieutenant Carey's feet, knocking him backward and leaving him grievously wounded. Still, he ignored his injuries to call in fire support, trapping the enemy fighters, applying a tourniquet to his wounded left leg, and giving himself a shot of morphine. Lieutenant Carey reorganized the defense, displaying calm control as they routed the enemy and captured prisoners. He continued to direct his men, barely conscious, until they were evacuated. Lieutenant Carey spent eight months in the hospital recovering from the wounds that would result in the loss of his leg, ending his naval service. At the White House on May 14, 1970, Bob Carey would be presented our nation's highest military award, the Medal of Honor. In 1972, he met fellow Medal of Honor recipient and hero of Vietnam, Joe Hooper. After leaving the Navy, Bob Carey would embark on a career in business, leading him back home to Nebraska as its 35th governor. He was elected to the United States Senate in 1988, where he served until 2001. Through his military service and honors, Bob Carey has served as a symbol of the valor and sacrifice of his comrades in arms. Through his continued service to his country, Senator Carey has earned admiration and respect from both sides of the aisle. It is for this service, during and since Vietnam, that Senator Bob Carey is recognized as recipient of the Joe Ronnie Hooper Award. Senator Carey, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it again for him. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely here for, for Joe Hooper and for all of their uh, Vietnam veterans. Uh, Faye and I were talking about Joe, and I uh, told her about the time that I met him uh, now almost 40 years ago and how much I admired him, how tall he stood in my eyes and still does. And she said to me, you know, uh, Bob, Joe was crazy. Um, and I said, well, I, I kind of know that, that he was crazy. Um, but he was crazy in love with his country. And he was crazy in love with freedom, and he was crazy willing to fight for that freedom. And so I'm here for Joe, and I'm here for every single Vietnam veteran to do the same thing, uh, to welcome them all home and thank you and thank them very much. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Let's give a round of applause for, for this senator. Served his country in a wonderful way. Thank you so much, Senator. A pleasure to have you with us. And also our thanks to Mrs. Hooper for coming every year, year in and year out, to make sure that her husband's honor is what it should be, and it is indeed. Thank you all very much. God bless you all. We now come to a very uh, special uh, part of the evening, the presentation of the Stefano Agostinelli Memorial Scholarship Award. Stefano was a promising young student with a tremendous admiration for the United States military, whose uh, dream was to someday serve as a special operations officer. Uh, tragically, he was killed in a hiking accident in 2008 while a student in Europe. And with the support of Stefano's father, uh, Mr. Robert, Agostinelli, we are proud to present this memorial scholarship in the amount of $15,000. The award is offered to the son or daughter of a special operations warrior who has rendered exceptional service to our country. Uh, the recipient must also demonstrate exceptional leadership abilities, an outstanding academic record, and a devotion to our nation's values exemplified by our military. The scholarship is presented in partnership with the Special Operations Association, which unites special operations veterans from across the branches and commemorates the memory of those special operators who give their lives in the defense of the free world. And before we introduce the recipient, we would like to welcome Robert to say just a few words about his son and the meaning of this very special scholarship award. Robert, please come out and be, and be recognized and welcome. Please give him a round of applause. Good to see you. How are you doing?
Um, I also have 60 seconds. Um, but as I was reflecting on what brief comments I might make tonight and what Stefano, uh, if uh, he were to have a say in it, would want me to say, I thought rather than another speech, I would do something else because we have another recipient coming up in a minute, uh, which is very dear to most of us, and that's Chris Kyle. So I'd like to dedicate a little prayer to him. If you'd allow me, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, as our angel <coughs> Chris rises higher in your kingdom, please take him unto you and your reign. Bless him and his family, for this is a man who only understood good and the madness of evil. He was a patriot warrior who defended this nation and all that it stands for in your name. He faced this evil time and again, resultly in the knowledge that it was his duty to keep us safe from the lair of those who don't dream with us, but rather who seek to destroy us. Bless him as all our heroes who gave of themselves and the ultimate sacrifice so that this nation would rem truly remain that shining city on the hill which you have so blessed. For the hands of this husband, son, father, and special brother, we collectively confirm that Wayne, Debbie, Taya, and the children will never ever be alone, ever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I know the nation of this. Thank you. We would also like to welcome to the stage uh, to help present the scholarship award, Mr. Christopher McClure, representing the Special Operations Association. Chris, please. We want to thank the Special Operations, on behalf of the Special Operations Association, I'd like to thank the Agnostellis for their generosity and uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. The recipient of this year's scholarship is Samantha Diane Shipman, currently a sophomore at Baylor University. Samantha is the daughter of Major Don Shippen and his wife, Diane. Major Shippen served for 30 years, rising from private to major, and served with distinction with the 5th Special Forces Group in the Gulf War. Growing up in a military family, Samantha has lived across this country and has been involved uh, in numerous charitable endeavors since she was very young. She has participated in overseas humanitarian assistance projects in South Africa, Costa Rica, where she'll be returning again in March 2014. She's enrolled in the Honors, uh, the Honors College at Baylor with interest in speech pathology and psychology and a goal pursuing a PhD following college. In both her charitable and academic pursuits, Samantha Shipman has sought to live by the spirit of the U.S. Army Special Forces to free from oppression those who are and has proven to be a very worthy recipient of this year's scholarship award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Samantha Shipman and her father, Special Forces veteran, Major Don Shipman to the stage. Hey Don. Congratulations, Amanda. Thank you. Um, on this special weekend, I would just like to say thank you to each and every one of you veterans for the future that you have given me and for the future that you have given our country. God bless you. Paul Ray Smith was the first recipient of the uh, Medal of Honor for Operation Iraqi Freedom. He was unfortunately killed in action on April 4, 2003, while fighting off an enemy attack from a company-sized force. His widow, Bridget, joined the American Veterans Center to create the Paul Ray Smith Award in 2006 in an effort to honor the service and the valor of his fellow men and women of this latest generation of American heroes. Let's hear the story of this year's honoree now. Navy SEAL Chris Kyle never thought of himself as an American hero. 
or even an exceptional sniper, but as millions know now, he was both. A veteran of four tours of duty in Iraq, Kyle saw combat in all of them, for which he was awarded the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star, and the Silver Star multiple times. Most remarkably, as a sniper, Kyle was responsible for 160 officially confirmed enemy kills. In 2009, Kyle retired from the Navy in order to spend more time with his family and wrote a best-selling book, American Sniper. He also devoted time to helping veterans in need. On February 2, 2013, he was fatally shot by a young vet suffering from PTSD, who he had tried to help. Following his death, it became apparent just how great the legend of Chris Kyle had grown. An outpouring of grief saw thousands of people line the 200-mile funeral route from Middle Othian to Austin, Texas. In an emotional tribute, Kyle's widow Taya said Chris was not interested in the number of kills that he had. He would have been interested in the number of lives he had saved. Saving lives was his only motivation. In the months since his passing, it's become clear the universal respect that Chris Kyle earned during his too short life. For his outstanding service in Iraq and for his support of those who served alongside him, the American Veterans Center remembers Chris Gile as a recipient of the Paul Ray Smith Award. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight as we honor the legacy of Chris Gile, one of the truly legendary warriors of this current generation, we would like to welcome to the stage Wayne and D.B. Kylie, Chris's parents, who are here to accept this honor on his behalf. Please give them a warm welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Kyle. I vote for you for president. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was doing pretty good until Robert gave that blessing. I thank you so much for that, Robert. It, uh, Debbie and I are very honored to be here tonight to receive this award on behalf of Chris. Chris was a type of individual, like the video said, he did not believe he was an American hero. He downplayed everything he did. He said that the true heroes were the ones that were still there fighting. And we should not forget that we still have boots on the ground there. Always keep them in your prayers, keep them in your thoughts. Chris was a very humble man and he had dedicated his life after leaving the service to give back to veterans. He formed the motto, it is our duty to serve those who serve us. And that's what he did. He always gave back. And in fact, he gave his life giving back, trying to help a troubled young vet. We thank you for this award. We thank the American Veterans Center for inviting us to be here. It is an honor. And we thank you. And God bless all of our troops, wherever they may be. And I must say, Semper Fi to all the Marines out there, and happy birthday tomorrow. Thank you. Congratulations. Tonight's award recognizing service in Afghanistan 
is named in honor of one of the Navy's greatest heroes and the first recipient of the Medal of Honor for Valor in Afghanistan, Lieutenant Michael P. Murphy. Lieutenant Murphy's story of sacrifice became legendary following Operation Red Wings, where Murphy and his team of three SEALs were tasked with reconnaissance of a Taliban leader's stronghold. After being discovered by local goat herders, Murphy faced a very difficult choice. The goat herders were clearly civilians, but were also likely to be sympathetic to the Taliban. Letting them go unharmed would assuredly lead to their position being compromised. Murphy did not hesitate, rightfully ordering the goat herders to be freed and his seals to adopt a defensive position as they awaited evacuation and, of course, inevitable attack. And before we present this year's award, we are honored to have with us here tonight Mr. Dan Murphy, who will say just a few words about his son, Lieutenant Michael Murphy, and stay on to help present the award. Mr. Murphy, please come forward. I knew you were here. I saw you. Thank you. Oh, please sit down. Thank you so much. Uh, I am honored on behalf of Michael's family to present the Navy SEAL Lieutenant Michael P. Murphy Award. I'm just a little surprised that Paul and Jim Roberts were willing to give the microphone up to myself as a lawyer. So I'll start my 20-minute summation right now. <laughs> Rather than tell you about Michael, my son, I'm going to put in a little plug. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, um, Marcus Luttrell wrote a terrific book, New York Times bestseller called Lone Survivor, that is now a movie. It is premiering January 10th. All these uh, veterans, my fellow combat wounded veterans and veterans, uh, I've seen the movie. Peter Berg was kind enough to give a special presentation to just Michael's family. It is a terrific movie. I would recommend it to everyone. So. Uh, other than that, I am honored to be here, and I want to thank you all. Michael, right, well, stay right here with us, would you? Just stay on stage. Just my, okay, right there. Uh, and, and he's, uh, this, as you just heard, the story of uh, uh, Michael and his fellow SEALs, Matthew Axelson and uh, uh, Danny Dietz and Marcus Luttrell, is set to be to uh, told in the soon-to-be-released major motion picture, Lone Survivor, starring uh, Mark Wahlberg, and, and Taylor Kitsch. Uh, before we present this year's award, we have a message from the film's writer and director, Peter Berg, who had hoped to be with us tonight, uh, followed, uh, but, but scheduled didn't allow him to do that, and he apologized about that, but he did, we do have the trailer, and then it will be followed uh, by the film's trailer, so here we go. Peter? Hello, everybody. This is Peter Berg, director of Lone Survivor. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to particularly send out on behalf of everyone from Lone Survivor, our appreciation and respect to Clint. You're an American hero. And um, much like Mike Murphy, who's another great American hero, um, it's our pleasure to be able to show you this film, which is a true testament to courage and sacrifice and brotherhood, uh, things that you know uh, more than we all do. So on behalf of everyone at Lone Survivor, we thank you for your service, and we hope that you enjoy the film. Petty Officer Shane. Can he say? Can you say it? Mr. Patton, please. Come on. Been around the world twice. Talked to everyone once. There ain't nothing I can't do. No sky too high, no sea too rough. Learned a lot of lessons in my life. Never shoot a large caliber man with a small caliber bullet. Anything in life worth doing is worth overdoing. Moderation's for cowards. I'm a lover. I'm a fighter. I'm a UDT Navy SEAL diver. Listen up. Red Wings a go. Bad guy. Senior Taliban commander. Shaw sure killed 20 Marines last week. 20. Going in with a four-man team. Axelson, myself, Dietz, Marcus. Thiefy. That's a lot more than 10 guys. That's an army. This 
Alpha is compromised. This is Spartan Zero One radio chat. Danny, you radio working? The way I see it, we got two options. One, we let them go, roll the dice. Second that they run down there, we got 200 on our backs. Two, we terminate the compromise. We cannot do that. I don't care. I care about you. I care about you. I care about you. Not killing kids, not feeling it. This is not a vote. We're gonna cut them loose, and we're going home. Roger that, sir. Roger. Yes. I'm fixing to get into a pretty good gunfight. Standing by the wall. And the guns. There's a storm inside of us. A drive. And push yourself further than anyone could think possible. You can die for your country, I'm gonna live for mine. God's looking out for us. We're good, right? We're solid. We can be heroes. Heroes, heroes, heroes. You are never out of the fight. Just for one day. Wow. Truly an incredible story of sacrifice, as you can see. And now joining us to help present this year's Lieutenant Michael P. Murphy Award is the 34th and current Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General John F. Campbell. General Campbell, please. Well, what a great, great evening. It is my honor tonight to talk very quickly about this next greatest generation. 1961, President Kennedy said that in the long history of our world, only few generations will have that opportunity to defend in its hour of need. I've served in combat as a brigade commander in the 82nd Afghanistan. I've served as an assistant division commander in Iraq. And I've served as a division commander in Afghanistan with the 101st Airborne Division. I've served with these soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen in Afghanistan and Iraq. They are our next greatest generation. And if we could turn the lights up and have all of our veterans and currently serving members of the service, all services that have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, please stand. We saw from the video it takes special people, special men and women, to stand up to continue to serve in our country's time of need. Afghanistan and Iraq, with IEDs, with the insider threat, our men and women continually face danger day in and day out. Let's see a quick story about one of these heroes. Staff Sergeant Clinton L. Romache distinguished himself by acts of gallantry at the risk of his own life above and beyond the call of duty, while serving as a section leader with Bravo Troop, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment, 4th Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division, during combat operations at Combat Outpost Keating in Afghanistan, October the 3rd, 2009. That morning, Romache and his comrades awakened to an intense attack by 300 enemy fighters, occupying high ground on all sides of the complex. Romache moved under intense enemy fire to conduct a reconnaissance of the battlefield and to seek reinforcements before returning to action with the support of an assistant gunner. He took out an enemy machine gun team, and while engaging a second, the generator he was using for cover was struck by a rocket-propelled grenade inflicting him with shrapnel wounds. Undeterred, Romache continued to fight, and upon the arrival of another soldier to aid him and the assistant gunner, he again rushed the exposed avenue to assemble additional soldiers. He then mobilized a five-man team 
and returned to the fight equipped with a sniper rifle. With complete disregard for his own safety, Romache continually exposed himself to heavy fire as he moved confidently about the battlefield engaging and destroying multiple targets, including three Taliban fighters who had breached the combat outpost perimeter. While orchestrating a plan to secure and reinforce key points of the battlefield, Romache maintained radio communication with the Tactical Operations Center. As the enemy forces attacked with even greater ferocity, unleashing a barrage of rocket-propelled grenades and recoilless rifle rounds, Staff Sergeant Romache identified the point of attack and directed air support to destroy over 30 enemy fighters. After receiving reports that seriously injured soldiers were at a distant battle position, Romache and his team provided covering fire to allow the injured soldiers to safely reach the aid station. Upon receipt of orders to proceed to the next objective, his team pushed forward under overwhelming enemy fire to recover and prevent the enemy fighters from taking the bodies of their fallen comrades. Romache's heroic actions throughout the day-long battle were critical in suppressing an enemy that had far greater numbers. His extraordinary efforts gave Bravo team the opportunity to regroup, reorganize, and prepare for the counterattack that allowed the troop to account for its personnel and to secure combat outpost Keating. Staff Sergeant Romache's discipline and extraordinary heroism above and beyond the call of duty reflect great credit upon himself, his comrades, and the United States Army. What a great way to honor Lieutenant Michael Murphy, but to present the 2013 Michael Murphy Award to Clint Romache, Medal of Honor recipient. It truly is an honor to, to stand up here tonight. Um, you know, my, my emotions are kind of running wild right now. I'm in a room with so many great heroes that surround me. Uh, and as I, I look back to that day, it wasn't one guy being John Rambo. I had a team, a team of guys that supported me along the way, and eight of them didn't make it back. And I'm here standing in front of you on their behalf. I'm so honored for your son's full measure of devotion to make sure his guys got back. And it's on behalf of those servicemen and women that do this still today in Iraq, Afghanistan, or wherever the next conflict takes us. It's always for them, not, not for self. Thank you very much.
The American Veterans Center's American Spirit Citizenship Award is presented to an individual or organization dedicated to preserving the legacy of our nation's veterans and military. We would like to welcome uh, Vice Admiral Robin Braun, Chief of Navy Reserve, to the stage to help present this year's American Spirit Citizenship Award. Admiral, please. Oh, you're not speaking right now. <laughs> Must be the wine. <laughs> we have welcomed some fantastic organizations and individuals to receive this recognition over the years, but truly, no one uh, individual is more deserving of this recognition than this year's honoree following uh, the unfortunate death of her husband, uh, Brigadier General Tom Carroll, in a plane crash. She uh, founded the tragedy assistance program for survivors, better known as TAP, T-A-P-S. TAPS provides peer counseling and grief support to those who have lost loved ones while serving uh, their country. It has become among our most respected service organizations. My father, Sergeant First Class Jeffrey Haycock, died in an Army training accident in 2002 when I was 10 years old. The following year, we came to TAPS for the National Seminar in Good Grief Camp in D.C. And it was the first time that my brothers and I ever felt like somebody truly understood what we were going through. Nobody understood what it was like to lose a parent and being in elementary school. Kids are mean, kids didn't understand what it was like. So, you know, TAPS was that resource for us, that family that we didn't have. Well, I actually heard about TAPS from our casualty assistance officer after my brother, U.S. Army Specialist Christopher Nyberger, was killed in action in Iraq in August of 2007. I actually called TAPS a few weeks after my brother's death um, because I had gotten up at a uh, women's networking event to give a presentation and I actually came apart on stage during the presentation and started crying. And so I reached out to TAPS I called and uh, initially was connected with another sister who, like me, had lost a younger brother. And she's someone I can call when I need some encouragement or someone who can understand some of the different things that you deal with when you're a family of a fallen service member. Meeting Bonnie was life-changing for us. You know, Taps and Bonnie and everything she's done has been amazing. Called me frequently just to make sure that I was doing okay, that my brothers were okay, that I was just getting by. And she does that for so many people. You know, it, for anyone who's ever known Bonnie, it's like she's your best friend and she knows everything. Bonnie is really the first um, other survivor that I've met in person um, after my brother died. Um, and she had a very warm, welcoming personality. I remember she gave me a hug. And I sat in her office and thought, this organization is amazing to be so welcoming and warm um, and to be able to help so many people honor and cherish their loved ones. I just want to thank Bonnie for everything she does. She's an amazing influence. Everyone who's ever met her has nothing bad to say about her. She truly makes an impact on those families. Bonnie Carroll is an amazing, giving, and loving person and I am so glad that she is receiving this honor for the incredible work that she does through the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. Bonnie, please, what a, what a pleasure to welcome you to the stage for this wonderful award, please.
What a, uh, what a humbling evening. And uh, on behalf of the now over 50,000 families who are part of TAPS, I want to thank you so much for uh, embracing us and remembering us. You know, the American Veterans Center is about honoring those who have had an impact and who are leaving a legacy. I was inspired to join the Air Force by my mother, who was a, an aviator in World War II, just as my husband was inspired by his father, who was a soldier in World War II. And uh, today, we, uh, we take that legacy, my husband's posthumously and mine in his honor, to change the lives of those who are grieving a loved one. When a commander knocks on the door and gives that devastating news and presents the folded flag, Taps is there to walk beside the family for the weeks and months and years to come. And I thank you for remembering our fallen this evening and honoring them. Thank you. We have come to uh, our final award of the evening which tonight will commemorate a very important moment in history, which was actually decades in the making. After the uh, surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, uh, the Americans faced defeat after defeat in the Pacific. And by early uh, 1942, morale, as you could imagine, was astoundingly low. Just before Christmas, 1941, President Roosevelt told the Joint Chiefs that Japan needed to be bombed as soon as possible to boost morale following the disaster of Pearl Harbor and to send a clear message to the Imperial Japanese that they were simply not invincible. To plan the attack, the military chose its best engineer, a famous pilot by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. On April 18, 1942, Doolittle led 16 B-25 bombers launched from the USS Hornet toward Japan. And each of the 80 men knew, as they flew with him, they knew that this could be, by all indications, it would be a suicide mission. Not only did they face the Japanese defenses, they had to launch their planes early after being spotted by a Japanese uh, patrol boat and would be short on fuel. They took off from that carrier, keenly aware of that fact. The bombers, as we all know, attacked targets around Tokyo before racing towards safety in China. Out of fuel, each of the planes had to crash land or their crews had to bail out. One landed in Russia where its crew was interned. Three died evacuating their planes. Eight were captured by the Japanese and held prisoner. Three were executed. And one died in captivity. The rest of the raiders regrouped in China. Doolittle himself thought the raid was a failure. After all, he had lost 16 planes and he came back, or expected to come back, and that he would be court-martialed. But little did he know that that raise caused a sensation right here at home. I mean, it was unbelievable. Morale shot through the roof as the American public saw the U.S. military strike at the heart of the Japanese empire for the first time and do real damage and make a difference. And just as important, the Japanese, shocked by that attack, hastily brought forces home to defend the islands. And this had a huge impact two months later at the Battle of Midway, the American victory that turned the tide of World War II. After the raid, Jimmy Doolittle received the Medal of Honor. The other 79 Raiders were awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, and the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders would go down in history with the most legendary veterans of the Second World War. Two years ago, two years ago, the surviving Doolittle uh, Tokyo Raiders, entrusting the American Veterans Center here with preserving their legacy, created the Wings of Valor Award to be 
to be presented to an Air Force veteran who had served with honor and distinction in the mold of General Doolittle and the Doolittle Raiders. The surviving Raiders are usually with us to help present this award. They cannot be with us tonight. We do have a special, special message from Lieutenant Colonel Richard Cole, who was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot on that legendary mission. I am Lieutenant Colonel Richard Cole, co-pilot for Jimmy Doolittle on the famous Doolittle Raid, 18 April, 1942. Of the 80 men who took part in the raid, today only four remain. All these years later, I am still amazed by the overwhelming response to the raid by the American people. In hindsight, the raid gave a major morale boost to the nation that was reeling from the defeat after the attack on Pearl Harbor. To ensure that the legacy of the Doolittle Raid lives on, we have established the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders Wings of Valor Award through the American Veterans Center. The award recognized veterans who embody their qualities, character, service, and honor in the mold of General Doolittle, our comrade. Thank you, and to all veterans, thank you for your service. And may that spirit of General Doolittle never die. Lieutenant Colonel Richard Cole, who just recently celebrated his 98th birthday. Let's give him a round of applause, and that's wonderful. <laughs> and it pleases us now to give you the story of this year's recipient of the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders Wings of Valor Award. On August 26th, 1967, then Major George Bud Day, commander of a squadron of F-100s, was leading a mission over North Vietnam when his plane was suddenly rocked by enemy fire. Though able to eject, he smashed into the plane's fuselage, shattering his arm. Upon landing, he was captured, taken to a bunker, and harshly interrogated. Despite treatment that would break many, Day refused to talk. His captors staged a mock execution and hung him from a rafter by his feet. Figuring that Day was too weak to attempt an escape, his captors took little care in securing him. They figured wrong. As Day untied himself and ran into the jungle, where he evaded enemy patrols, living off berries and frogs. A few weeks later, Day heard helicopters and stumbled toward the sound. Realizing they were U.S. choppers evacuating a Marine unit, Day hurried to catch them Unfortunately, he arrived just as they left the landing zone. And his bad luck continued, as the next day he encountered a North Vietnamese patrol, which shot him and returned him to the very same camp from which he escaped. Major Day was soon moved to the infamous Hanoi Hilton. The conditions were miserable. Day suffered from malnutrition, his wounds were untreated, and he was repeatedly tortured. His captors believed they had broken him, as Day finally began to talk. But once again, they were wrong. Though broken physically, Day had the mental strength to provide them with false information on every important question. In February 1971, American POWs gathered for a forbidden religious service, when enraged guards burst in with their guns drawn. At that moment, one of the prisoners stood staring directly at the guns and began to sing. The song was the Star Spangled Banner, and that man was Bud Day. One by one, fellow prisoners stood, joining in the anthem to freedom, their bodies broken, but their spirits strong. George Bud Day was finally released on March 14, 1973. Three years later, along with fellow POW James Stockdale, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. A veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, Bud Day would become the most decorated living American prior to his passing on July 27, 2013. For his leadership among the POWs, he became an Air Force legend and a name that every American should know. A great hero, fierce patriot, and good friend, 
The Doolittle Raiders and the American Veterans Center are proud to honor the legacy of Colonel Bud Day with the Wings of Valor Award. Here tonight to represent Colonel Day are his wife, Doris, and his son, George Day Jr. Let's give them a big round of applause. Well, as many of you know, my father uh, passed away end of July. Uh, he left a great legacy. Uh, that legacy was given uh, to him and passed on to this country, this great country, uh, the one that he respected so highly. And I remember as a kid when he came back from Vietnam, he said, my hero is a guy named Jimmy Doolittle. I didn't know at that time who Jimmy Doolittle was, except that he led something called the Raiders over Tokyo. <laughs> of course, uh, I'm a history buff now, but I will say that uh, the legacy that Jimmy Doolittle gave my dad as his hero uh, is so great and so powerful uh, for one thing. We have a nation that was founded on principles that is like none other in the world. And this nation has a constitution that so many have volunteered to support and defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, in fact, Jimmy Doolittle once said that the uh, and I'm getting this uh, a little bit off right now, but basically, there's nothing stronger than the heart of a volunteer. He led 79 other men, a band of brothers, over a nation that decided to pick against us, and he said no. And he took that torch from the American public, and on behalf of the founders of this great nation, uh, to our enemy and showed that freedom is worth fighting for. Right. We are so grateful uh, for the Doolittle Raiders as tonight they honor three of the four remaining honor those who have gone before. Uh, tonight they and you honor not only my father who has gone before us but that honors all of those who currently serve and will serve as volunteers of this great nation. Uh, so from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of my brother and my sisters who can't be here, and with my mother, uh, the real Doris Day, uh, we thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much for honoring Bud. Uh, he called uh, Jimmy Doodle, uh, Jimmy Do, and he always just, just worshiped what he did. And I think when he started the uh, Super Sabres, the Misties in, in Vietnam, I think he had about the same number of men that Jimmy had that day. Um, in fact, he had Jimmy's picture right on the wall, right next to his desk. And the first time I met Mrs. Doolittle, uh, it was at a presentation that they had made a statue of Jimmy, and she said, that's my Jimmy Do. <laughs> so I think that's where Bud got the Jimmy Do from. But we're honored to be here tonight because this is just really a great honor for Bud. He was a good trooper. He served in three wars. Uh, he was a good citizen, and he just loved the veterans. And he did more for the veterans, I think, after he retired. And then his biggie is when he got you TRICARE for life. Thank you for the honor for Bud. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight is uh, 
indeed a truly historic night, and one that we are about to take part in, a historic thing. After the war, the surviving raiders gathered each year to commemorate the raid and to honor their lost comrades. In the 1950s, they were presented with a set of 80 silver goblets, each inscribed with the name of a raider. For decades, that case has held a bottle of Hennessy Cognac from the year 1896, the year of Jimmy Doolittle's birth. So tonight, right now at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, three of the four remaining Doolittle Raiders have gathered together. And in a special ceremony happening as we speak, one of the last major events of World War II, decades in the making, is now taking place tonight, and you're a part of it. To those in the darkest days of World War II who gave us hope and inspiration, and to those who 71 years plus later still give us hope and inspiration, to the Doolittle Raiders. Here, here. Here, here, here. Oh, 